Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Perplexity, a mystery podcast. As always, I'm your host, Kadra, and I am so stoked for this story today. I've been wanting to tell this story on the podcast for a really long time. It is an incredible survival story. So really looking forward to telling you guys the story. Uh, I hope you all had a great Thanksgiving. And I just wanted to quickly announce I'll be doing another collaboration with a different podcast uh, next month. And I will keep you guys posted on that. But definitely looking forward to that. If you are new here, I tell tales that have perplexed me every single week. We talk about UFOs, paranormal, cryptids, true crime, and just all things unexplained. So if that sounds of interest to you and you love a good mystery that leaves you wanting more, please be sure to add this show to your list. Or if you are watching on YouTube, hit that subscribe button and keep up with those new episodes each week. Very quickly before we get into this episode, I do just want to give a trigger warning Morning, as this podcast is not for children and we will be covering a survival story. So there is some heavy content in here that may not be for you. So listener discretion is advised. And as always, the sources that were used for today's episode will be available down in the show notes. On May 28th, 2013, about 28 miles off the coast of Nigeria, 100 feet or 30 meters below the surface of the Atlantic Ocean, Three divers are approaching a sunken tugboat. The boat had capsized in a storm two and a half days prior while it was towing an oil tanker, and this boat was called the Jaskan 4. The divers were planning to make a report and investigate the crash for the boat's parent company. The boat was found at the very bottom of the ocean floor, upside down. And as if this wasn't eerie enough, the divers also had the incredibly taxing task of recovering the bodies of the 12 crew members who had perished in the accident. So the divers are making their descent 10 stories down or 100 feet. They have flashlights because it's the bottom of the ocean. It's completely total darkness. They also had tools that they needed to use to get inside of the boat and their jackknives just in case a shark or a barracuda got any bright ideas because, again, they're recovering human bodies. They also have microphones and cameras on their diving helmets to communicate with the technicians in the boat above to ensure their safety. And they're also like guiding them where to go. So everything that I'm about to tell you can be found on YouTube. The divers are making their way down to the tugboat. Eventually they get safely inside and they begin to navigate the tight upside down corridors. So the technicians are telling them, you know, go here, go here, turn here. And it's very disorienting. It's pitch black. It's the bottom of the ocean. And this boat is upside down. So in the video, you can hear the technician explaining to this one diver, his name's Nico. And he keeps telling him, remember, this is the ceiling. This is the ceiling. Remember, everything's upside down. And he's talking about how disoriented he feels. So just picture that on top of everything that I'm about to tell you. Like, this is the situation. So it's disorienting, it's dark, and they're trying to recover these human remains. Eventually, they do find several bodies, and they're continuing to talk to the technicians above when one of the divers, a South African man named Nico Van Herden, and in the video, they say Nico. I'm not sure if it's the man's accent or not. Um, so it could be Nico. But this man is the one that you can see in the footage. And he tells the technician above that he just felt something whoosh across his back in the darkness. He was in the very back of the line of the divers. So he knows that he is vulnerable to predators. His flashlight is the only source of light, and it's coming from in front of him as well. So when this happens, he has no idea what could have just swam past him. So he spins around, a normal response, and he pans his flashlight from left to right, up and down, trying to investigate the source of this whooshing sensation behind him, but he can't find anything. After a couple of seconds and seeing nothing, and again, this is on camera, 
a human hand can be seen reaching out towards Nico and towards the camera and it grabs Nico. And it's very clear from the footage that for a split second, Nico freaks out. Again, normal reaction, but he quickly regains his composure. And the man that has been guiding him through this whole descent, the technician, uh, confirms, oh, it's just a corpse and it's trying to calm him down. But Nico, you know, grabs the hand and it grabs him back. So I'll put the link in the show notes if you want to watch this video. But a total shockwave goes through the entire technician room. And of course, Nico's probably having a heart attack, this poor guy. And this is when you hear the technician shouting, he's alive, he's alive, he's alive. This man would later be identified as 29-year-old Harrison O'Kenny. And he was a very practical man. He was a Nigerian cook for the tugboat. He was the youngest of his family of 13 kids, uh, known as the helper by his mother. And he is the sole survivor of this shipwreck. He has been underwater at the bottom of the icy Atlantic Ocean, 100 feet down for three days. So before we even talk about how this is possible, we need to go back about 60 hours. 4.50 a.m., May 26th, 2013, Crew members are waking up to begin their workday on this tugboat, the Jaskin 4. Okina opens his eyes, rises out of bed, says his prayers, a morning ritual for him, and then he threw on a pair of boxers and headed to the galley to turn on the hot plates for breakfast. So after he does this, he goes to the restroom, and he's thinking about how he's due to go on leave in a couple days. You know, he's looking forward to seeing his family, getting some time off of the boat. Among Okena are 11 other crew members with 10 more Nigerian nationals on board, four being cadets, and the boat's Ukrainian captain. So as Okena makes his way down the halls towards the bathroom, he quickly notices the waters are very choppy this morning. The waves can be felt crashing against the sides of the tugboat. It's tossing the boat back and forth. But Okena, along with the other crew members, deal with weather like this all the time. So they probably weren't worried. He stumbled his way to the tiny bathroom and sat down to do his business. Imagine the size of a bathroom like on an airplane. So it's tiny. He's squished in there. And this is when, without warning, a massive wave would crash against the side of this tugboat. Within seconds, Harrison is being thrown around the bathroom. He looks up and sees that the toilet is now above him and the ceiling is below him. He then felt a sharp pain on his head, realizing he hit his head on the toilet during this crash. When he touched his head, he realized it was gushing with blood. And to make matters worse, he knows now that the boat is capsized. With all of his strength, he manages to get the rickety bathroom door open and he enters the hallway. But like a scene out of the Titanic, water is rushing towards him. So he knows that he needs to think quickly and he manages to get on a life jacket, then run towards the boat's exit hatch. But this hatch was locked, which was a common safety practice as pirates could infiltrate their boat. This water is coming towards him. He's running around the boat and he can't find an exit that will open. So then he runs to the second exit hatch and it is also locked. Finally, on his third try, he finds an exit hatch that is open and he makes it out. This is when the crew members in the hallway that were close by were suddenly washed away right before Okina's eyes by a powerful force of dark water. Okina would later share this terrifying account saying, quote, I knew those guys were dead. So within seconds, a large burst of water then hits Okina with full force, forcing him into another tiny bathroom. The boat then crashes against the ocean floor and it's pitch black as the boat continues to fill with water. So again, having to adapt Thinking quickly, Okena swims up towards the bathroom sink because the boat is upside down and he sticks his head inside of this sink 
and he finds an air pocket. So this allows him to breathe, but it just has enough room for his head. The rest of his body is completely submerged in the unforgiving icy waters of the Atlantic. So Okina is obviously in shock. He's trying to figure out what to do. And meanwhile, he can hear the horrifying screams of his crew members. Okina would later say he could hear people screaming, God help me, God help me, God help me. But after a few minutes, the tugboat fell completely silent. For an entire day, Okina stays in this tiny bathroom with his head in this sink, which is just absolutely unbelievable. But eventually the day would pass and Okina had come to terms with the fact that he couldn't stay in this bathroom any longer. He knows that he's freezing to death, he's at risk for hypothermia, and he needs to look for an exit. But this was also a huge risk because by moving from this spot and being in total darkness, he could get disoriented and he could drown. He also knows that the bodies of his fellow crew members are close by, and this puts him at risk for being attacked by a predator. But Okina remains calm and knows that he must persist. He thought about his mother and his wife back on land in his home in Nigeria. Before he makes the dangerous swim, he says a quick prayer. He said, If you rescue me, I will never go back to the sea again. Never. Then he quickly pushed himself out of the bathroom sink, holding his breath and diving downward. Using all of his strength once again, he opens the bathroom door against the pull of the water. This bathroom was attached to the adjoining captain's bedroom. So he's swimming around in this bedroom and he swims upward and finds another air pocket. And this time, it has about four feet of headroom. And for those of you who are like me and wondering how these air pockets are even possible, uh, consider this helpful analogy. If you were to take a glass and turn it upside down and push it quickly into the water, the air that was in the glass would have no place to get out. So the air would stay. The air would slowly mix in with the water over time, but this could take months. So he's investigating this basically tiny room of air, and he realizes he can lift most of his body out of the water. So he decides this is where he's going to set up camp for the time being. He starts scavenging for any supplies he could possibly use, like an underwater MacGyver, and he manages to find a pair of coveralls. So he tears the coveralls into strips and he creates a rope. He tied it to a sturdy object and then he used the rope, and this is genius, as a guide to help him safely navigate the ship's corridors without getting lost. And this made me think of like those rope courses that people do uh, in the wilderness, you know, like trust exercises and you're blindfolded. So the ropes are like your only way to navigate. It's like really the only thing I can equivocate it to. But super, super interesting. And he's scavenging. And he also, of course, has to continue to be very careful to conserve enough oxygen to get back to the small air pocket room in time to get a new breath of fresh air. So basically, he's getting a breath of fresh air. He's diving into this pitch black water with a rope as his only guide. And he's just feeling around in the darkness, trying to find anything he could possibly use. So he's like fishing, basically. And... The more that he does this, Okina manages to strip together wooden paneling from the ceiling, a lightweight mattress, and a metal rack. So he puts this mattress on top of these wooden panels that he has strung together. Then he throws this metal rack on top of these wooden panels uh, that had floated to the top of the captain's quarters. And he uses this as basically a life raft. And he hoists himself on top of it. And this is what he would use anytime he got too cold. He even managed to find a can of Coca-Cola and a tin can of sardines. But what he hasn't found yet is an exit. To quote Paula Kokoza from The Guardian, In total darkness and silence, Okina found himself in a strange moment, in a place beyond all maps of human survival. It was as if he had passed into a parallel world 
with only a faltering sense of time and little to cut through the sensory deprivation other than the muffled hum of vessels moving through the ocean nearly 30 meters above him, end quote. So by the time he's got all these materials together, another day has gone by for Okina. So he's now been under the water for somewhere around 48 hours, and it's hard to like fully gauge the timelines of all of this, obviously, because, you know, it's not like he's checking the time as he's underwater. But we know when the boat capsized and we know when he was rescued because of the, the divers. So this is, you know, the estimated timeline. But at this point, Okina can also perceive the dead bodies of his crew members nearby because there's a lingering smell of death in the air. He knows predators coming is only a matter of time. So it's not long before Okina hears a loud and terrifying noise, and it's noise that he has not heard before. Okina would later say he strongly believes the noise he heard was from a shark or some type of other predators fighting over the remains of the crew. I just, I cannot even imagine the horrors that this man had to endure. After the two-day mark, Okina starts to lose hope and reality is setting in for him more and more. He's starving, he's dehydrated, he's super cold, and the constant exposure to salt water has rubbed his skin raw. Crayfish had also been making a meal out of him. They were biting his torso, his arms and legs, they were making wounds. It's just horrible. And like I said with the air pockets, you know, the air pockets can survive for months, but he doesn't have months. He's starving, he's freezing, he's dehydrated, and Okina also knows that any sudden shift of the tugboat on the ocean floor could result in these air pockets quickly closing up, causing him to drown almost immediately. So he's praying profusely. He was a very religious man and he was calling on God to be rescued. At this point, about 60 hours has passed when Okina hears another new noise. And this time, it's the sound of metal scraping against metal, like a hammer. He knows that he's not alone, and this is probably his only chance to be rescued. So again, thinking quickly, he lowers himself into the icy salt water, searching for any blunt object he could use to hit against the ship and get these people's attention. So he's just trying to make all the noise that he can. He manages to find a sink faucet and he pulls out the filter, then swims back up to his air pocket room. With all of his might, he's banging the filter hard against the walls, but nothing happens. And soon, the hammering sounds fade away. But after a while, a tiny beam of light can be seen in the distance. And this is when Okina sees a diver swim into the room beneath him. So he lowers himself down into the water, but the diver swims away quickly and disappears. And he's trying to find him in the darkness, but he's unsuccessful. So this is the second time that he hasn't been able to get the attention of these divers. And of course, he doesn't know how many people are down here, so I'm sure he was super panicked and worried that this was his last shot at survival, and now it's gone. But now for a third time, within minutes, he sees this beam of light again, and Harrison quickly dives into the water. This time he's ready and he's moving towards the light as quickly as he can. And he soon finds the diver. He swims at him from behind, getting as close as possible. But Harrison knows he needs to be careful, because he isn't stupid. He knows that these divers are not here to rescue him. They're here to get bodies. Also, remember, all of the divers have jackknives to protect themselves from predators, so one wrong move and Harrison could be stabbed. So Okina settles on the following. He gets as close as he possibly can to the diver and lightly taps him on the shoulder. Can you imagine how terrifying that would be if you were this diver? <laughs> 
is just insane. And this diver was, of course, the same diver from the beginning of the story, Nico or Nico Van Herden. So at this point in the story, we have come full circle. The team learns there is a sole survivor and Okina has officially made contact with other humans after three days. But of course, the adventure isn't over. Okina is still 10 stories down at the bottom of the ocean. He needs air, and Okina leads Nico to the air pocket room to basically get air and also figure out a rescue mission. Like, how are they going to get him out of here? Harrison is also understandably overcome with emotion. So he's bawling, he's crying out. Uh, he tells Nico that he had given up all hope, but that God had answered his prayers. And as relieving and remarkable as this all is, this story is nowhere near over. This is not going to be a simple rescue. Okina cannot simply be lifted back up to the surface. He's weak, he's freezing cold, he's dehydrated, he's starving, and because he's been underwater for so long, he is showing signs of carbon dioxide poisoning, and he's at high risk for decompression injury. He could go into cardiac arrest. It's, it's very serious for him. Okina was panting, and his eyes were glazed over. His rescue had to be very carefully curated by experts. So an on-call doctor gets involved, and Alex Gibbs, a life support technician, happened to be in the control room as well when all of this happened. Uh, I don't know if this is standard practice or what's supposed to happen in an investigation like this with retrieving human remains, but I'm very glad that this person was here. And Gibbs would later say, Contrary to popular belief, when people are trapped in confined spaces, it's not the oxygen running out that will kill you. It is your own exhaled breath causing a buildup of carbon dioxide. So the team manages to quickly get an air hose down to Okina, and they pump fresh oxygen over him. Then they funneled down a mixture of oxygen and helium in order to help ensure that he wasn't given too high levels of oxygen, because helium is easier for weak lungs to handle. And remember, there's video of all of this. So when the technicians and Nico are talking to Okina, you can hear how the helium has affected his voice. And to be honest, it's pretty difficult to understand what he's saying because the helium is so strong. So you mostly just hear the technician talking him through everything and trying to keep him calm, which he does a great job. Another expert named Christine Cridge was also consulted on Okina's rescue to make sure that he would be safely depressurized. According to Cridge, if Okina had ascended back up to the ocean surface without proper medical care and equipment, he would have likely gone into cardiac arrest, or he could have faced serious neurological damage. So they're working on him, they get him stabilized, and eventually they are able to suit him up in diving equipment and put a diving mask over him. He was then given a what they called an umbilical, so a rope, I guess, and he was instructed to follow the team out of the tugboat, and he was placed into a heavy-duty diving bell to help keep his body at the same level of pressure as he makes the long trip back to the ocean surface. A diving bell, for those of you who are like me and didn't know what that was, uh, it is a personal transfer capsule. It's designed to transport divers from the surface to the deep depths of the ocean normally uh, and back in open water. So it's usually used by workers who work under the water. You basically climb into this tiny metal capsule and then you can be brought back above the water. So he gets back to the ocean surface slowly and carefully in this capsule and then he had to be immediately placed into a decompression chamber. So he's still not able to go home yet. He had to stay in this chamber for two days, which I'm sure was just agonizing. 
He was given food and medicine, and he was closely monitored by professionals. This is where he also learned the suspected truth. He is the sole survivor of this shipwreck. And of course, for the diving team, this is a miracle, a marvel. You know, they've never seen anything like this. To survive that long underwater and at that depth is unheard of. After two days, Okina would finally be released from the chamber. And at this point, it was recommended that he go to the hospital. But Okina had had enough. He was absolutely adamant he needed to get home to see his family, which I don't blame him at all. And eventually he was finally reunited with his wife and his mother and was finally back home. But for anyone who is familiar with trauma, I'm sure you all know that life for Harrison Okenna was never the same after this. He continued to deal with survivor's guilt, nightmares, and PTSD. Okenna would later say in an interview, and this is so heartbreaking, Quote, when I'm at home, sometimes it feels like the bed I'm sleeping in is sinking. I still think I'm in the sea. I jump and scream. I would pick up my wife, carry her, and try to open the door to get out. End quote. He saw a psychologist, but would later say about this that she wasn't making any sense to him. So he didn't find that helpful. And, of course, the thought of going back onto a boat and the ocean in general now terrified Okina. And he had made a promise to God that if he survived, he would never set foot on a boat again. So a year goes by, and Okina starts driving to work with a friend when his car flies off of a bridge and into the water. Like the tugboat, the car flipped upside down. But Okina thought quickly and swam out of the car. He soon realized his friend was still in the passenger seat, though, so he had to swim back really quick and fish him out. And luckily, they both survived with no injuries. But what are the damn chances? So after escaping death for the second time, this is when Okina said that he would ask himself, what are you afraid of? How can you be scared? You've seen so much. If you have come through this... I think you should not be afraid of anything. Fair. Unfortunately, though, Okina's marriage did not survive. He was divorced in 2015 and was battling depression. He was cooking in restaurants on land for a couple of years, but he didn't enjoy this work. And after all of these major life events, Okina made a very big decision. He decided he was going to become a commercial diver. He even got a job with the same diving company that rescued him. As a child, Okina loved the sea, and he even dreamed of buying a home and living by the ocean someday. So finally going back to the sea and finding his love for it again gave him a new purpose. Today, Harrison regularly goes underwater and does underwater inspections. He also installs things, and he works in the same waters that he narrowly escaped death from. He's certified to dive up to 160 feet deep, six stories greater in depth than where he was all those years ago. It's also possible Okina could someday be sent on a rescue mission. And I'm sure if anyone is qualified to be a rescuer, it's him. He also now has a new partner and three children. In June of 2022, on the ninth anniversary of his rescue, Harrison would post an update on his YouTube channel. So I have a quote. He says, quote, I thank God for this strength, for keeping me alive, for giving me a second chance in life, to be a better person, to be a hardworking person, and to have a reason why God kept me alive. And for me to know, someday, I might be a rescuer for someone else, end quote. Harrison always loved the ocean, even as a child. He had a dream of living in a home by the water. And this experience changed his life in so many ways. Harrison even says the accident improved his life. According to Harrison, we are all one, and meaning comes from the lives you touch. 
He also now has a house by the lake. And he says that when he gets enough money, he plans to have a house by the ocean. While it is believed there's somewhere around 3 million shipwrecks on the bottom of the ocean floor, survival at the ocean bottom trapped in a boat is extremely rare. It's widely believed that Okina unintentionally set the world record for surviving the longest underwater. Experts have studied his case, theorizing perhaps the air pocket room was connected to another pocket, cycling in more air to increase chances of survival. The cold water could have also possibly decreased carbon dioxide levels around Okina, but despite scientific theories, experts still have a very difficult time rationalizing just how in the hell Okina survived 100 feet down on the freezing ocean floor of the Atlantic, surrounded by predators in total darkness with 11 dead crew members around him for three days. So perhaps a mixture of luck, persistence, and adrenaline is what fueled Okina to continue. Some experts have even called Okina's survival an example of divine providence. But whatever the case, this story is certainly perplexing. And that is the absolutely insane, incredible, tragic, but also hopeful story of the survival of Harrison Okina, the man who survived three days at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. I hope you guys enjoyed this story. I certainly did, and I loved telling it to you. If you had a great time, be sure to let me know. If you're watching on YouTube, let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. And don't forget to like this video and hit the subscribe button. If you are listening on a podcast platform and you enjoyed, I would love it so much if you would leave a review on Apple or Spotify. If you are on Apple, let me know your thoughts. Write out a review of how much you enjoyed this episode or tell me your favorite movie. You know, tell me something about you. (laughs) I would love to hear it. You all are amazing. I hope you have a great week and stay safe. And I will talk to you next week. Bye.